Okay, everybody, you're all very welcome here to Clyde Road. Um, thanks for coming in. A bit of a, a dirty afternoon, so thanks for, for braving the, the elements. And again, for everybody uh, dialing in on webcast, you're all very welcome. I suppose first order of business, if I could ask you just to, to silence your phones and take notice of the emergency exits at the back here and the, 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 beside the stairs. Uh, for those joining for the first time, um, my name is John Kane. I'm Director with Energy and Technical Services and Chairman of the Energy Environment Division. Um, we run a series of, of lectures and breakfast briefings and seminars over the year from between October to May. And this is our um, potentially second last, potentially third last lecture of the year. Um, we're very happy to have um, Ray, Ray Langton from the SEI, who's going to uh, talk about the support scheme for renewable heat tonight. And um, if you could maybe hold off the, the Q&A until after Ray is uh, finished. And if anybody has any questions on the webcast, if you want to send your questions into engineerswebcast at gmail.com, that's engineerswebcast, all one word, at gmail.com, and we can pick them up on the iPad and put them to Ray when he's ready. Okay, that's it, I'll hand over to you, Ray. Thanks very much. Great, thanks, John, and thanks for the invitation to uh, join you today and, and to bring you up to date on the support scheme for renewable heat. Um, my name is Ray Langton, I'm with the SEI, and my role is a program manager for this new scheme. It's an emerging scheme, it's in development, um, we don't have all the details, um, but the general direction of travel is, is reasonably clear at this stage. And I'm hoping that for people like yourselves, um, who have a technical background, um, you'll understand the logic of where we're trying to go. Um, so I don't have specifics in terms of terms and conditions, so if somebody asks me about their particular application or the particular process um, may not be able to answer that, um, but certainly the, what, what's underpinning the scheme. So what I want to take you through today is really the background to the scheme, why we're doing it, um, why, why it's important, what it's trying to achieve, um, and as I say then, what the principles are behind it. Um, okay, um, so just looking at it in terms of context, um, you know, what, what are the main drivers <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little bit fluey today. Um, what are the main drivers for, for Ireland and for, for Europe? Um, and there's a number of them. So there are emission reduction targets, um, and generally most of the targets have been set for 2020, and they're indicative for, for 2030. We don't know exactly what they're, what they're going to be in, in 2030, um, but they're going to be more stretching. So emission reduction targets, 20% by, by 2020. Energy efficiency targets, um, again, 20% national reduction, um, probably going to 30, 35 for, for 2030. Um, renewable energy, um, which is the part we're interested in, um, a, a national target of 16%, um, and again, an increasing target likely for 2030. Um, and that's all in the context of an emerging national energy and climate plan, um, which, will, which will be published in 2018, which will be the government response to this direction um, and, and um, climate that we're in. So if we look at um, the, the specific area, so I'm looking at the specific one there, there at the, the bottom one, renewable energy, that's 16%. Um, the national target of 16% of renewable energy, that's, pro that's made up of a weighted average of a number of um, sub-targets. Sub um, so overall 16% renewable energy, which is 40% renewable electricity, 10% renewable transport, and 12% renewable heat. Um, and, and just looking at where, where we sit um, in, in, in terms of um, comparison with, with the rest of Europe, so the, the blue bars are the darker bars being, being Europe and, and the, the green bar, lighter bar being, being ourselves in Ireland. Um, so we're, we're pretty close to the rest of Europe in, in terms of um, electricity, a um, bit behind on transport, way behind on, on heat. So in terms of the, the amount of renewable heat that's generally in use in, in, in Europe, we were at 6.8% at the end of 2016, um, as I say, a target of 12%, um, and basically just not, not gonna cut it, um, not gonna hit that 20, 20, um, 2020 target unless we did something about it. So in, in a broad sense, um, What's the impact of the SSRH and why, why, why bring in an SSRH or support scheme for renewable heat? Um, the bottom line there, and th this is a relatively simplistic diagram, the bottom line shows that there, there, is, um, there is an uptake of renewable heat. So it's not, if we do nothing, 
um, renewable heat is, is growing, but, but it's growing too slowly. Um, and, and expectations were that it would hit about 9% by, by, by 2020. Um, and the purpose of bringing in a, a support scheme for renewable heat is basically to change the trajectory of that line, change the slope of it, um, and get more uptake. That's ba basically what it's all about. Um, and the target being to, to um, change this, the, the slope to such, such an effect that it gets 3% more. And you don't have to be particularly astute to, to notice that, that models um, were, were done at, at the time when we thought the support scheme for renewable heat would, would hit, hit off in 2017. It hasn't, hasn't done so. Um, so we're going to have to work particularly hard to get that slope to, to um, be more severe, given that the, the point of inflection is going to be later in the graph. So in terms of developing then the, the, the support scheme for renewable heat, a, a, a lot of thought process goes into the background of it. There was two rounds of stakeholder consultation. Some of you may have been involved in that. Um, range of options considered, all, all sorts of options, everything they could think of from the carbon tax side to supplier quotas, quote obligations, tendering systems with exchequer support, um, or then direct aid, investment aid or operating aid. And they're, they're all hypothetically the type of things that you can do to get that kind of um, impact in the market. Um, backed up by, from within the SEI, a lot of um, modelling and behavioural insight, um, you know, what drives consumer behaviour, what drives decision making, um, and, and there's a, a fairly high level of understanding of that from, from an SEI point of view, and modelling of, of um, the impact of those different in, um, interventions, you know, which, which one would do what. Um, economic analysis, a um, no, number of specialists, um, Element Energy, Frontier Economics, um, did, a, did a very deep uh, economic analysis of, of, of the market and of the potential for um, price changes in oil and gas and so on and so forth and, and what that would happen. Um, and then, then into more practical um, elements, um, you know, learning from other jurisdictions. We're in the very good place in, in many ways of... of um, seeing some of the, the, the mistakes and the errors or the, the loopholes that have ha happened in other jurisdictions, um, and that's helping us in, in, in terms of, of um, where we want to go with this scheme. And, and above all, um, all, all of those options um, from a policy point of view and a department point of view um, and an exchequer point of view and, and a taxpayer point of view is about getting the best value for money. So getting that 3% um, deflection on the graph um, with, with, with the best value for, for exchequer input. Um, so right, right now, where, where are we in relation to the, to the support scheme? Um, it was approved um, by the government on the 7th of December, 17. Um, so so that, that was a big milestone in, in the program. And at that stage, it's outlined at a very high level. The, these documents are, are in the public domain. Um, it's, give, it's a scheme overview. It's, it's a one and a half pager. Um, and there's a government memo that formally goes, goes to government, to, which gets, gets approved by, by government. So very high level approval of, of the bones of the scheme. Um, SEAI have been appointed to administer the scheme and develop the detail and build the program. Um, and that's what, what, what we're doing now. Um, build the terms and conditions, setting the standards and defining eligibility, and basically, in a nutshell, turning that scheme outline into an operational process. Um, when we looked at some, some of the other schemes and advice from, I, I suppose, um, um, colleagues in, in Ofgem and so on in the UK, um, their, their view and their experience was that it, it, it took them a year to move from scheme outline, so that very high level, into operational detail. You know, so taking that one and a half pager and getting it in, into, into the detail of what, what exactly are the terms and conditions. Um, we're, we're, we're not going to take a year. We're, going to, we're, going to, we're working on a timeline of roughly half of that to, um, to get it into, into an operational process. Um, we have a budget. Um, we have a budget for 2018, um, 7 million, rel relatively small. But again, um, it's, it's a, a, a meaningful figure in the sense that... Um, it's, it's a goal of us in the, in the SEI to spend that money. So again, that gives a sense of a, of a, of a deadline and a timeline. Um, we, we, want to, we don't want to be handing back any of that money on the 31st of December. We want that out there. Um, so given that we don't have a scheme now, um, and we've got about eight months to go, um, that, that's our target. Overall, just as a sense of scale, um, 
and that's why I said the 7 million seems relatively small. In, in the National Development Plan, which was published about a month ago, there is 300 million. Um, it's not in the form of budgeted sense, but it is allocated as a, um, a government intention um, to, to, to spend that scale of money. And that's what our models tell us. That's the kind of figure that we expect um, to, to, to be spending. So, as I say, 7 million gets it, gets it kicked, kicked off um, and, and um, the 300 million then over the, the life of the scheme. So, so, so what, what, what exactly is it? Um, it's a hybrid scheme. Uh, that means there's, there's two, two, forms of, um, uh, two forms of payment. One of which is referred to as investment aid or grants. Um, so the grants for heat pumps. Um, and then there's operational aid, which is ongoing quarterly payments um, for biomass heating systems and anaerobic digestive he he heating systems. Um, so anaerobic gas and biogas heating systems, basically. Um, the investment, investment aid is a grant of up to 30% um, for, for heat, heat pumps, basically air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, water source heat pumps. Um, and the operational aid then is based on the eligible heat use. So it's the heat output and the el eligible heat use. Um, and, it, and it's on a tariff base. So there's a number of cents per, per unit of heat, basically, and w which reduces, I'll show you in a, a, a second on, on the scale, reduces. It's the opposite of income tax in the sense that tiered and, and goes down as, as, as the output goes up. Um, so one is a grant up front, um, not directly related to heat output, um, and the other is directly related to heat output on an ongoing basis. One being the grant is a, is a one-off payment, um, that's it. Um, the, the operational aid um, goes on for a period, a period of time, goes on for actually 15 years. Um, and the, these are the proposed initial tariffs. Um, so, so, so this is, this is the, the, the money part of, of the operational aid. Um, and as I say, they're cumulative. So, so if, if, if somebody has an eligible heat output of 1,000 megawatt hours per, per year, they get 300 at, at 5.66 and another 700 at 3.02. So, so that accumulates, um, you know, just, just to give a sense of scale on, on, on that, um, or you can do the math yourself. The, the, the 300 comes out at about 16,000 per, per annum. Um, up to a, there's, there's a maximum if you get right right the way up. Um, it's, a, it's about 231,000 um, euros per, per annum on a, on a rolling 15-year basis. Um, anaerobic digestion on a, on a lower scale. Um, and those um, tariffs will be reviewed annually then um, by the department based on... Um, impacts in, in, in the market and so on. The intention is that, that um, anyone who's signed into the scheme holds on to the tariffs that they've got, um, so those tariffs don't change, but somebody who comes in a year later might, may well be on a different tariff. Now, there is one exception um, with what's called a windfall clause, um, whereby if some, something very unusual happens in the market, um, but the, the general direction of, an, of intention is, is that um, um, you lock into a particular tariff and, 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 and hold it. <coughs> so so how, are, how are the technologies supported then? Um, so b based on usable and eligible heat output, um, from renewable heating s systems, obviously, this is all about renewable, so uh, any, anything that's heated in any other way um, is, is not eligible. Um, and existing installations that convert, because that's, that's what it's all about really, it's converting away from fossil fuels on, onto renewables. So ex existing installations that convert over to renewable fuel, um, or new installations that have some kind of a counterfactual. And what we mean by that is that um, there, there are some unusual um, circumstances, to be honest a lot of them are still quite hypothetical, um, where, whereby the only possibility is a renewable source, particularly with some of the very advanced new building regulations coming through and so on. So this is not about giving money to, um, for installations that have to, fundamentally have to happen. Um, in most cases, th there is a counterfactual. In other words, it means that a building or a process or whatever has an option to put in oil or gas versus... Um, but but there, there, there is, as I say, hy hypothetical possibilities that... that um, that, that there is no alternative, and if there's no alternative, that doesn't fly. 
so there's some common terms and conditions there in, in terms of eligibility regardless of what you're doing um, and that and I'll take you through those in, in, a, in a minute and then the specific terms and conditions related to the particular technologies so it, it, it's a bit of a um, handful really the, these terms and conditions and, and you know, in some ways, we, we even asked our, ourselves, uh, you know, coll colleagues in the SEI, what, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to get a scheme that, that works? Or are we trying to get a scheme that, that um, stops people get, getting involved? Um, we are trying to get a scheme that, that works, and we are trying to help people through this scheme. Um, but there are reasons for, for these eligibility criteria. And the purpose of conversations like today is to try and um, get people to understand what that reasoning is behind, behind it. Um, they're not about having um, terms and conditions just for the sake of terms and conditions. But some of the, these contracts are, are quite substantial, and as we all know from um, other, other jurisdictions, um, there's a lot of, um, how would you say, um, watching interest in schemes like this, and we're not going to be on the Sunday newspapers about um, heating sheds with no roofs and so on. We're, we're just not going to let it happen. So in terms of that, then, there's eligible applicants, and we talk about that, eligible heat um, heat use in buildings and en energy efficiency um, criteria and that's, 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 that's a key one it's one of the key distinctions that protects the, the um, and, and takes some of, some of the risk out of this scheme um, definitions around what, what useful heat is how we measure heat um, the heating technology which is the, 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 the heating um, equipment that you use installation standards sustainability a lot of this you'd expect really to be honest you know if you, if you even want to grant for insulation in your house you know most of this type of thing applies um, and then there's the principles of an incentive effect in other words there, there, there has to be um, as I say some, some kind of counterfactual a decision made on the basis of, of support um, I talk about the project funding and the payments um, and then there's ongoing obligations particularly in, in the area of um, uh, operational support so I'll go through each one of those at, at, and, and give you the, the background to it and, as I say, a fairly high-level um, direction of travel for each of these. So in, ter in terms of eligible applicants, so who, who, who can apply? Um, so basically anyone in the commercial area, industrial area, agricultural, public sector, um, or district heating. The, the only two that are really excluded, to, to be honest, are, are um, sites that are in the emissions trading scheme. So, you know, electricity generation and some of the very big, heavy en energy users. Um, cement plants and so on. Those uh, sites know themselves who, who are in the ETS, um, and not single domestic. So this is not a single domestic scheme. Um, domestic can come into it through district heating, um, but not um, not Ray Langton's house or apartment, or not somebody else's house, house, or, house or apartment, um, and 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 not even if it's attached to a. Um, if I'm claiming that I have an office downstairs or upstairs or whatever, um, it's not designed for single domestic. Um, in terms of eligible heat, um, basically space heating, so heat in this room, heating buildings, um, water heating, process heating in industry, what, whatever that be, uh, pasteurization, bottle washing, what, what, whatever it is. Um, there, there will be exclusions, and these are just examples, so um, they're not the only exclusions. Um, again, there are learnings from, from other schemes, so it's not, um, we won't be um, allowing heat in, in, in open buildings, smoking zones, you know, outside pubs or whatever, you see pubs sometimes with heater, heaters out in an open area, um, private swimming pools if you've got, um, I don't know, soccer players or whatever, they have this, this kind of thing, or defrosting grounds or floors, that, um, are, are not any form of heat that is produced um, with the purpose of receiving the grant. So there has to have been a logic to the heat. The heat has to have been there. Um, if, if it, you know, we've used a flippant example before, if somebody has a great idea about drying Christmas trees or whatever, now that there's a grant in there, that's not going to fly. You know, you have to be able to show that there was, there was a logic to that, that that heat would have happened anyway under economic purpose. Um, so it's not about um, heat, um, heat for heat's sake. When you go into the buildings, um, and this is a good example of where we're trying to, um, we don't want to invent any new regulations anywhere, but we want to parallel everything that's appropriate. So in, in, in terms of buildings, um, we'll, we'll use the building regulation classifications. Um, so again, not going, not going to go through them bit by bit, but um, there's, 
you may be aware of them, um, group, group One, which is defined as single domestic dwellings, they're excluded, as I say, uh, un unless by way of district heating. So we'll be using the same classification. So if there's any controversy, if somebody says, well, look, this really is a hairdresser's and I just have an apartment up upstairs, we'll fall back on the building regulations. How is that defined? Show, show us your, how, how, you've, um, how that building is, is, you know, what property tax you're paying or whatever, you know, how, how is the building defined? If it's defined as a, as a domestic, single domestic, um, it's, it's, it's not going to fly, as I say. Um, they have to be per permanent and fully enclosed. Um, so so um, not, um, I don't know, mar marquees that you see in, in hotels. That some, sometimes they, the people might argue they're sem semi-permanent or they're for the, the wedding nearly every second day or whatever in the marquee, but it's not regarded as, as a permanent building. Um, and not... not um, um, buildings that are, that are not enclosed. So you think of, say, garages that have a, um, a permanently open front wall um, that's only, only surrounded on three sides or whatever, and as I say, smoking zones, that kind of thing. So they have to be uh, enclosed buildings. Um, and, th and this is the classic sheds with no roofs on it, basically. To, you know, we're not going down that route. Um, it, it won't support any um, heat that's mandated by regulation. So, so again... Um, the, the new building regulations, which, which are not in, in place yet, but I, I think it's 2020 um, or maybe 2019, I'm not 100% not, not sure. Um, there's regulations in there, for example, about 20% renewable energy. Um, so our starting point would be that 20%. Now, that 20% could be got in, that's renewable energy. We're, we're comparing apples and oranges there. But what we will look to is the application um, that was made or, or the the, the um, approval under building regulations and if that was I'm trying to simplify the example but if that 20% of energy was got by putting in a biomass boiler um, mm -hmm. then that won't be supported by here and on the other hand if the 20% is achieved by for example putting solar panels electricity or whatever and nothing to do with the heating then the heating could be quids in or, or something in between so our starting point will be what did you have to what did you have to do um, and if, if what you had to do had nothing to do with heating, that's great. Yeah. Um, but if what, what you had to do to get yourself um, through the building regulations included the heating, um, would be interesting anything over that. Um, you know, if you go 40%, 50%, 60%, absolutely. Um, so the fabric first principle, um, and again, this, this is around um, get, get, get the installation or the process, to be honest, it's not just fabric, um, get your energy efficiency right. So again, don't don't be putting it into into places that are that are um, just wasting heat all over the place. Um, and we leverage other schemes, the, the BER scheme or, or or any other appropriate appropriate schemes that will ha help people go in that direction. Um, and I suppose uh, coming from a commercial background, this this is a, a, a slight um, challenge for us in in some ways. In that we're not here about selling renewable heat per se. Um, our, our first ethos as an organization our first principle is to um, improve efficiency and reduce energy basically so um, if, if, if we struggle to get that three percent but but actually achieve quite a lot of, of reduction in energy that then, then um, that, that would be that, that, that would be a good thing but we're certainly not going to drive that three percent for the sake of three percent so um, we will be asking people to f number one first point of, of call um, is, is to get your efficiency right and I'll talk about that in a sec so in terms of yeah, in terms of efficiency, it lead, leads straight into it here. Um, there, there, there is um, an SEI relatively new Exceed model. Um, it stands for Excellence in Energy Efficient Design, um, and it's a really good model for this. Um, and again, it's an example of us trying to parallel on, on other processes, not invent a new, a new scheme. And in simple terms, um, and we could spend a whole day on, on, on Exceed, and I'm not an expert on it, but you could certainly spend a lot of time on it. Um, fundamentally, it defines the, the, the acid, documents the current heat performance or energy performance. It's, 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 it's not specifically a heat. Um, it challenges the process and looks for a, a, a opportunities to reduce um, and prepares an energy management plan. So that, in simple terms, it's a methodology um, of looking at whatever your process is, whether it's an industrial process, a hotel, a chicken re rearing, a poultry area, mushroom growing, whatever it is, um, you look at what, what, you're, what you're trying to do, document what, what your performance is, compare it to, to um, benchmarks, 
um, and get a plan to get that energy down. And that's number one before before um, before you before you move on to um, approval for a particular heat output. After that, then you've got the useful heat, um, and useful heat is, is, is a very s- simple concept, really. It, 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 there's an economic test to it, um, and a, a lot of this came out of the CHP type work. Um, you know, what, what was when you, when you have heat as a byproduct, what, what what's useful, um, and and basically, um, useful heat is is that the heat use must otherwise exist. You know, so so it has to be. Um, it's an economic test, um, so um, there has to be. If there was no SS or H, would would that heat have been used with, with a different payment m- mechanism? Um, then we're into measuring. So measuring the heat particularly important for for the um, for the operational support. Um, and obviously, we need metering and metering, and so heat meters in in place to um, to ensure effective monitoring at the point of use. So it's not the heat output out of the boiler; it's the heat at at, at the point of use, um, and and renewable heat only, obviously. Um, but where that refers to is is you know if you've got a backup system, um, as a, a lot of places would with, with biomass, and um, that they might have a, a backup system or might retain the old system. Um, and the complexity of the metering kind of really depends on the installation. Um, if it's a sing- simple installation with sing- single boiler and single use point, um, that could be a very simple metering system. If it's got backup, then you have to be able to subtract one from the other and so on and so forth, and you need to be able to verify it. Um, if it's got multiple use points, um, could have mul- multiple meters. Um, you think of a district heating system, for example, it could, could have a, a whole plethora of, of, of meters. Um, so the, 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 the scale of metering really de- depends on, on the complexity of the project. Um, in terms of the technology itself, those who are talking about whether it's biomass or, or, or CHP or, or heat pumps or whatever, um, manufactured relevant standards, again, th- th- this will be made clear when we get the detail of the terms and conditions. Don't have them now, so don't ask me specifically what standard it is. Um, Heat transfer has to be via some kind of a, 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 a thermal liquid, basically, water, oil, or, or steam. It's just that air, air to air is very problematic in terms of measuring heat, heat output. Um, and it's solid and, and gaseous biomass only, so not, not liquids. We're not talking about ethanol or, or, or anything like that. Um, heat pumps then will, will have a, um, a minimum seasonal performance factor um, that, that, that will apply. Um, so. so even though um, the grant is a one-off, we will be asking for feedback on on, on the seasonal performance factor. Um, <coughs> it's not that we don't envisage looking for the money back, um, but we do envisage looking for um, the expected seasonal performance factor, the, the use rates, what you expect to get out of it. Um, and for monitoring purposes, we want to be able to track that, to, to look back on the scheme and see, look, is, is, this, been, is this working? Is, is, is it not working? Um, Installation standards again fairly fairly standard for any of these sports schemes. Um, good good design and quality standards. Competent installer. Um, any other standards that as appropriate if it's carbon monoxide or, or whatever it is the the, the relevant st- <coughs> relevant standard. <coughs> Excuse me. Sustainability. Um, when you think of it as a renewable scheme, and this is all about the whole. Um, impact on the climate and um, sustainability particularly important um, and we're really talking about the fuels um, and, and the emissions really that, that, that's that's the big thing so um, there is an emerging green gas certification process it's well worth looking up um, it's not in in it's not in use quite yet but it's very 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 close um, which will track um, anaerobic gas from production all the way through to um, ultimately to to um, injection into the grid um, but it also um, has a methodology of, of measuring um, its, um, its, its, its emissions and, and, and its total um, sustainability right through the supply chain. So, for example, if it's, if it's an anaerobic gas that's um, pressurized and put into a road tanker and moved from one place to another and so on, um, it could still well be eligible, but it's, it's losing green points along the way. Um, Solid fuel standards w- 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 will apply, and in, in terms of um, you know, the, obviously has to has to be renewable fuels and, and, and so on. We're not about burning plastics or tires there. Um, and the the, um, the the red two, um, which which are the, the 
the, the energy directive that, that's emerging. That, that's, those are the standards that we, it, it's in consultation at the moment, and they're the, again the standards that we're going to piggyback on. And, and, and other stuff like, so, so uh, you know, obviously uh, stuff around forestry, um, land use and wild. Re really the red too stuff falls, in, falls into two categories. It, it, it looks at um, where did you get your, your um, timber from? So it's agricultural sustainability or forestry sustainability and renew, re renewing forestry basically. Um, so that, uh, you know, it's not um, stripping wood off of protected areas and so on. And then it looks at, at um, um, over, overall greenhouse gas emissions. And then there'll be air emission standards, not NOx and particulate matter. Um, in terms of the, the incentive effect, what I mean by that is, uh, it, this, this really is, is a core principle of, of state aid. When, when, when th this scheme, when you stand back from it, is, is seen by, um, by, by Europe and by economists really as an intervention in the market. That's fundamentally what, what this a scheme like this is. Um, and under those circumstances, an intervention in the market um, has to have approval from uh, from European state aid, basically state aid process, um, and that, and when you think of it, that makes sense. Is to stop all the different countries uh, interfering in their own markets and managing or pushing things in a particular direction. Um, and fundamentally, um, it, 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 the the key ask there is is that it, it is um, an incentive to move into the renewable field, as distinct from a um, promoting of particular type of technology or particular type of, of, of market or market distortion as well as trying to avoid. Um, and and um, grants, the grant will be eligibility over, over and above counterfactual. So again, if, if, if there's any particular um, things that had to be done, um, that, that's excluded before, before, the, 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 um, before the, the calculation is, is made. Um, the project funding and payments, there's, there's a number of controls on it from that point of view. So from our own uh, budget point of view, we have an annual cap. So for example, as I said, the relatively small 7 million this year, and um, the 300 million then over the coming years, which, which equates to about 20 or 25 million per year. Um, so that's one cap. We, we can't spend 9 million this year, for example. That's, that's one protection on it. Um, there will be a project budget cap, which is a key part of this scheme. So. With all the things that I talked about, when an applicant goes through all of those then and says, this is my heat use for my hotel, this is what I expect to use, this is a, the number of megawatts that I expect to use, this is how I've benchmarked it, we'll sign up to that and we'll agree to it. And that's the support that will be provided. So if that had come out at 1.46 megawatts or whatever it is, um, that will be part of the contract. So it won't be a kind of an endless con contract, it'll be a specific contract with, 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 that, um, with that applicant. So that's what I mean by the project budget cap, and that's to stop individual projects running away with themselves. No, nothing stopping somebody coming back again and applying again, but it's to give us a control of the budget, um, because otherwise um, we, we, we won't know where we are. We, we expect about 2,500 applicants over, over the first three years, so, so, and some of them could be quite sizable. So e each one will have an a allocation, as it were, um, and then the tariffs are paid quarterly. The ongoing obligations, um, so full compliance with the terms and conditions, so, so, um, and retention of an audit trail. So, so for, for example, um, if there's a particular fuel um, for a particular type of technology, be, be it anaerobic gas or green gas certification or a particular type of wood that in a particular boiler gives a particular particulate matter um, um, in, into the air, the audit trail needs to be there. So at any, at any time, um, we won't, won't be auditing it every month, but on occasions and on a spot check basis, um, we will look to marry that up and say, look, we, you, you got 25,000 from us last year. That equates to so many tons of um, kill and dried wood or whatever. Um, show us the, the invoices to, for, for using that um, and subject to inspection at any stage. So, so where do we go from here? Um, it, the, the process for, for state aid approval is, is live in the, in the sense that the application is in. It's a bit like applying for planning permission or whatever. The application has been made. Um, we're waiting for feedback on that. The terms and conditions, which is my, my role in it and, and, and the SEI role, um, we're operationalizing them. So bringing those kind of concepts that we, we talked about in, into very specifics that, that will be clear to, to, to clients. Um, the terms and conditions have to be officially approved by, by the 
Minister for Communications, Climate Action and Environment. Um, and when we have our terms and conditions, we'll we, we, we go through that process. Um, and all the time, we're trying to balance the customer journey or customer experience with, with um, risk and governance. So protecting the, the exchequer in terms of, of why we have terms and conditions, and at the same time try, trying to uh, guide and help um, people through, through the process. And, and um, we actually want, we want applicants, we want this to happen. Um, when we're open for, for applicants, um, it follows th those processes. Um, we have to have state, state aid approval, we have to have the ministerial approval of T's and C's. I don't have a date. Um, generally, we, if we want to spend that seven million, we need to be getting applicants um, across our table in quarter three. Um, if they're only coming in in quarter four, it's going to be very hard to spend that money. Um, so in a broad sense, that, that, that's what, what we're trying to achieve. But I'm not saying here now that it's going to be the 1st of July, um, but it's broadly in that area. It's not going to be next week. It's not going to be May. It's, um, it's going, to, going to be sometime around quarter three. Um, we expect new, new approvals to, to, to roll for, for, um, for three years. It's not an absolute um, as I said, it's all about getting that, that um, inflection point on, on, the, on the graph. It's all about getting that change over. It's all about the, sp the, the speed of applications. We, we know there is a bit of a backlog. The, 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 it's a funny place in the market really now at the moment. It, it, people are waiting, obviously. Um, but it's hard to judge. You know, models are one thing. It's, it's hard to judge exactly what, what will come through. But it, it's envisaged um, that we'll be taking applicants, not forever, um, for, for three years, and the scheme would then run um, for up to 18 years, you know, the last one that came in on, on the end of the 31st of December in the third year or whatever, we'll, we'll have 15 years of, of payments thereafter. Um, that's, that's our scheme. Just, just one um, call, call out um, to you, just w watch out if, if, if you're around. It would be great if you could come along to the, the energy, energy show. It's two weeks from today, um, Wednesday and Thursday. It's SEI. A lot of, um, a lot of experts in, in, at that and a lot of um, networking and opportunities to talk about these and other schemes. So ho hopefully that put it in context and op open to questions. John, if you want to. Yeah, hang on there, right. Right. Thank you. Raising the microphone here. Hello. Um, right, thanks very much. Um, that was excellent presentation. Um, um, just wondering where you would anticipate um, a lot of the demand to come from from this year. Do you have any kind of um, feeling for kind of industrial, commercial, sure. where it's going to come, e even the initial tranche or over those couple yeah. of years? <coughs> Sorry, before I forget, yeah. I again, if anybody has a, a, an email question on the webcast, apologies, right? It's sure. engineerswebcast at gmail.com. Sorry, Ray. Yeah, that's okay. Um, we don't we don't know exactly, John. Um, we, we're getting a lot of interest from what are called small commercial agricultural. Um, a, a lot of um, groups um, are, are starting to form, such as the, the poultry farmers and mushroom growers and those kind of areas, and they're 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 building a, li a little bit of momentum and trying to understand it for themselves. Um, so I suppose you're you know you're looking at the what, one megawatt a year, half a megawatt a year, that type of area. They would be generally biomass boilers. Um, the Heat Pump Association have, have come to us and are looking for more information as well, so they're, they're obviously um, very interested in it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would see um, agriculture kicking off pretty quickly, um, because they, they, they've been waiting for quite a while, really, to be honest. But, but, but you know, I, 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 the reason I say that is, I, I suppose, um, some of the more commercial organisations um, probably are on a, a more planned kind of process of um, investing in their, their plant and so on, but we'll, we'll take any applications. We expect, to, just to kind of give a little bit of flesh on that, um, the, the model tells us we'll get about two and a half thousand applications. So the first thing about a model is it's going to be wrong, um, but it's broadly, you know, we have to have something to go on and, and we had to justify this through the, through the exchequer and so on. So the model tells us that to get that 3%, we will process about two and a half, applica two and a half thousand applications. Um, more than half, about two thirds of them are actually expected to be heat pumps, but smaller and um, about one, they see old kind of 80-20 rule. Um, biomass boilers will, will be bigger and then small numbers of CHP plants. 
slightly yeah. answered my question already, but um, <coughs> just in terms of said some did some economic analysis. Sure. Uh, what kind of impacts do you see on the supply chain, and do you see any impacts on the supply chain? Have you looked at that? Sure. And the second part is, is like, do you expect applicants to be um, by kind of heat supplies, heat suppliers? So do you expect that kind of model to happen, or do you expect kind of solo applicants like hotels sure, sure, and sure. that are coming through? Sure. So let's pick the, them off w one by one, David. On the, on the supply chain, um, it, it is one of the broader justifications for this scheme is to, is to support the supply chain. So for, particularly in the biomass area, um, the biomass um, supply chain is relatively ad hoc, for want of a better description, in Ireland at the moment. Um, and I don't mean that in any insulting way, but um, it's not as, you know, we saw the heat out, output that, that um, Ireland is by comparison with Austria's or, or Scandinavia or whatever, where they've got a very mature biomass market. Um, so it is hoped that the scheme will, will help that in, in, in a number of ways. Firstly, it, it creates a market um, starts to bring that through. The sustainability standards will, will, will promote the right behaviours. Um, we do want to piggyback onto schemes. We, we're not going to invent an SEI um, quality scheme for, for timber or whatever. Um, there are schemes in other jurisdictions. We've talked to the Wood Fuel Quality Association and they're hope, hoping to develop a scheme. So it, that, that should help that kind of market. Similarly in, in the AD kind of market as well, to try and get it kick-started some, somewhat. Um, what, was, what was the other question? Sorry, <laughs> the last of the trend. There was two questions. One, Oh yeah, yeah, different type of suppliers. Uh, um, no, this this is fundamentally for the heat user, but we do expect that the a lot of the driving energy behind this will will be um, some of the suppliers. You know, a lot of the queries that we're getting at the moment are suppliers trying to understand it. We know from from life <laughs> suppliers will, will will be using this as a sales pitch opportunity and so on, and 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 that's fine. Um, but it won't be, we, we don't support suppliers directly. So a supplier, um, and, and there's an overlap with, with, with different schemes. Um, yeah, if, 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 if there's suppliers where if this happens to overlap with other obligation schemes or whatever, that, that's great. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I think there'd be a key player in it, but, but won't be um, funded directly. Yeah. Hi, uh, Liam Tolton is my name. I'm a consulting engineer, and I'm a member of the committee as well running the event this evening. Um, it appears that the applications will only be taken from organisations that are converting from a fossil fuel to a biomass. Um, I've seen two situations in my private practice in the last 12 months where um, organisations are already in biomass, yeah. but their systems are coming to the end of their useful mm -hmm. life. In fact, one of them is probably well past the end of its useful yeah. life, really, yeah. and it's just about hanging in there. Um, is there a plan that those kind of organisations could also avail of this on the basis that um, uh, if they're now at a competitive disadvantage to people that are converting from fossil fuel, mm. they will just sure. not proceed sure. with uh, the replacement of their existing sure, system sure. and you'll end up losing existing mm. biomass. Mm. Mm. Have you thought that one through or have you been in contact with the department in connection with representations that may have been made already on this topic? Sure. So understand the question um, and, and you're right there is that phenomenon or practical absolute reality out there and um, the scheme as defined um, that mandate that we've been given from government is for conversion it's absolutely black and white that it's for conversion um, but that's not to say that that, that um, challenge that you've just articulated very well there Liam it is, it is understood um, what, what the answer to it is going to be I don't know, um, but the, the scheme for we're developing in terms and conditions for now would not include um, ongoing replacement of biomass systems. Um, and, and, I, and I understand the, the, the background to your question and I understand the logic of your question, but um, I'm just trying to give you an answer as clearly as possible. Um, I suppose the, re the reason I ask it is because if um, if people that were all that had already invested sure, quite some yeah, time yeah, ago no, in, yeah. in the technology, yeah, yeah, yeah. you'll be counting that in your biomass, and then suddenly when those people fall off yeah, the end yeah. of the world, uh, this scheme will your, sure, your point sure, of inflection sure. will start to go the sure, wrong way. Sure, sure. So yeah. I, yeah, I guess that's a, that's a is risk. it something that yeah. the department just didn't consider? Um, to, or should we now be thinking of? Putting it back to them and saying, "Look, guys, you know there is a weakness here. Yeah, yeah. There is a clear weakness here." So, right, would the counterfactual, if it's near end of life, counterfactual not be to drop back to fossil fuel? In which case, counterfactual is 
Yeah, yeah. So I think all I can say, Liam, is that that, that point is, is well made and is well understood. Sure. Um, and it's, it's a topic of discussion and debate at the moment. Um, Very good. Well, I'd encourage you to think about that. Because I can see the logic in what you're yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, yeah. The other point is that some of these systems sure. are there quite a long time now. Sure, yeah, the yeah, first yeah, tranche yeah, of this probably yeah, happened 20 yeah, years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Hi, uh, Keith Bale from Ionic Consulting. Um, I'm not sure if I scribbled the figures down right. Did, uh, five uh, uh, euros per megawatt hour, is that the, the, the initial rate at 5.06, I think? I think so. So would I, would I be right in saying that if you're generating uh, 1,000 megawatt hours per year, you'd be looking at about 4,000 per year? In biomass? In biomass, you're talking about, is that, is yeah, that right? Yeah, yeah, or 5.6. Uh, no, 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 no I, think, I, think, I think you're a bit less. So you, you get 300 at, um, that, that comes out at, uh, it's a bit strange here, there's kilo, kilowatts and megawatts, so that, that comes out about 50, per, 50 euros per megawatt. Um, so 50, but it's about 16,000 at, at 300. So if you, if you generate 300 megawatts per year, I'm just doing this off the top of my head, um, 56 by 300. Is roughly sixteen thousand, and then you, then you kick in. With, so, what was the size you gave? The, the example you gave? I'm just saying, if you if you generated uh, a thousand megawatt yeah, so, hour. Yeah. So so the, so you you bank bank the sixteen thousand if, if my maths are right, and um, then you get seven hundred at, at thirty, which is about another twenty one grand. So. Thirty eight thousand per thousand megawatt hours. Sorry. You get thirty eight thousand. Yeah. So. Grand yeah. So ch ch twenty one and sixteen is what 16, I say. Good on you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So okay. yeah, thir thirty-eight is it? Is it thirty-eight thousand? That seems right. I okay, was saying six, sixteen, and, yeah. and twenty-one. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to get clarity. So that, that's what I mean. But I mean, cumulative. So you keep at, you keep you bank what you've got and add, add another. Um, and if you if you keep doing the maths on it, you you, you get all the way up to two hundred and thirty-one thousand. Okay. Uh, that was just a clarification. I suppose the second point is: uh, Have you done any benchmarking on the capital cost of the installations? Um, to see where they're at now, and will that be monitored? Because I've, uh, I worked on a scheme that was quite similar in Scotland, and, and there was certainly a perception that once the scheme kicked in, installation costs went up, and therefore, you know, potentially the grant or the, the, the funding, well, for heat pumps anyway, the, the funding could be going to installers rather than into the yeah, um, the person installing. Yeah, and, and that's uh, fundamentally that's the reason for ongoing reviews. So, so it's been done on the market as as is. Um, I suppose, even to be fully frank, it's the market as was probably 18 months ago or two years ago. Um, so already the ball has moved a little bit. Um, but that's the kind of inputs that would be put into ongoing tariff calculations. So th 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 there's quite, quite um, how would you say, quite, quite, quite a lot of algorithms and, and complicated calculations behind this, which I don't even fully understand. Um, but they're, they're based on all the things that you said, you know, the prices of fuel, the prices of capital, and this, uh, yeah, it, it all goes into a big sausage machine and comes out with, um, and, and those things will change, yeah, absolutely, and, and that, that's why tariffs will change. Okay, thanks. I think we have a question from um, the webcast. It's a question in from Cormac Nevin from Veolia, I think it is. Um, hi, if the renewable, t renewable targets are challenging to achieve, why was the ETS sector excluded from the scheme? Yeah, it's, 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 it's very straightforward, really, in the sense that there's, there's a number of diff different sectors. Sorry, who was that? Keith? Cormac, Cormac, sorry, Cormac. Um, the schemes, as, as I understand, Cormac, are... are targeted at different populations. So there's domestic, there's ETS, there's different drivers. We talked about earlier about all the different drivers. So there are particular drivers in the ETS scheme. Uh, um, they're not this. Um, this. There are particular drivers in the domestic scheme. They're not this. Um, this, this is for that I intermediate ground. Um, so um, yeah, this, it's as simple as that. And the, 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 the maths are done on, on what type of what specific area and as i say there's the drivers in the ets you, you, um, you probably know as, as well as well as i do they're they're different ones so this do, doesn't apply um. 
Uh, Brian Montaigne, ESB. Um, Ray, just two questions kind of related. The first is um, in the context of trying to engage the market. You know, we, we don't, it won't be launched until Q3. Is there any inten in, in, intention to kind of engage around the, the kind of detail that we required of applicants to facilitate successful and prompt kind of um, sure. uh, eligi eligibility? Sure. And secondly, is there a closing date as well? I know SAI has a as a, a process usually whereby if you don't get in by a certain date, you don't get annual funding. So is, are we talking about a June to September process? Or are we talking about a June to end of year? So let's, let's take them one by one, Brian. Um, the, the, there isn't a formal process yet to engage. We, we, we have to be very careful, and I, I'm, I'm very conscious of even being here today talking about a scheme that hasn't been approved at ministerial level. Um, so some of the things I told you, hypothetically, could be different. Um, but I'm sharing with you everything we've got. So in that sense, that's part of that journey. I'd, I'd love to get it to a stage where we can start to, what I'd really like to do actually is get a few pilot projects. And, um, but we can't do that yet until we get the scheme approved. So um, I would hope um, to have a, a soft opening as soon as we can get it across the ministerial table um, where we could work with clients. Because uh, any, any of you that have seen new schemes before, that, 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 this is a learning journey for us all. Um, we don't have all the answers. Um, there's going to be there's going to be a lot of stumbles along the way. There's going to be a lot of um, areas for clarification and so on. Um, so I would hope to do what you're what you're asking. Um, there isn't a specific plan as such to do that at this stage. Um, but as soon as we can start to engage, and um, we're even looking at the um, for for example um, the state aid process. We think that some aspects of this may be possible to progress without the state aid full state aid approval. But again, we just need to be very careful on that. You know, it's a bit like building some of your house that doesn't need planning permission. <laughs> it's a dangerous kind of way to go and you can really um, you can really upset the key stakeholders. So, so we're, we're, we're watching for opportunities to go forward as best we can. In terms of the um, closing date, um, I'm conscious of that that can be quite a hurdle. Um, we'll be doing whatever we can to make it as practical as possible. Um, I'm not sure at this stage what closing dates are going to be, but yeah, absolutely the runway is coming at us from both ends. <laughs> We're racing through the year and losing months, and um, you're you're rightly flagging up that the year ends a bit earlier than we think. So, yeah. Um, yeah. There's a couple of questions on the webcast. We might sure. leave it at that. Just yeah, so there's, there's two there. questions sure. here. Okay. So uh, the first one's in from Cormac. Again, um, will new waste processing sites under construction, including AD, be eligible for SSRH? New waste process. Um, we need to be very careful there. Um, in a lot of cases, no. Um, it, it would depend on the specific. So this is not about waste uh, waste heat. So this is about renew, renewable heat. Um, so there can be a, a, a renewable element to, to waste. Um, but it's, it's not about... Um, Municipal waste, for example, um, that would be totally not eligible. Um, on the other hand, there's waste aspects to forestry and there's waste aspects to, um, um, yeah, to, to um, food crops and so on that go into anaerobic digesters. So we need to be very careful on the waste, waste description. Um, it would be renewable waste. Um, what, what was the full question for Cormac? Just, um, new waste processing sites under construction including anaerobic digestion be eligible for ssrh yeah the the, the other so there's, there's two aspects in in your question cormac if, if i understand it right and we can, we can talk about it separately um one is the waste whether the weight the source of the energy um, or the heat is eligible so we'd need to trash that out um and the second one is the newness you need to be very careful um the, the principle of the incentive effect is or one of the principles is that an application is approved before it progresses so plant under construction could well fall out of the bed on the basis that what do you need support for when the plant is already um, and the last question here is from des murphy from cover and the table of proposed tariffs that one there uh, does not show heat pumps any indicative figures yeah, well, you see the heat pumps. The heat pumps are all around grants, so they're, they're not. The heat pumps are not directly related to this at all. So the heat pump is around the investment. So they're two completely different models. Um, 
the, the same eligibility criteria in terms of the useful heat and measuring the heat and all that kind of stuff, and, and, that, and that will, the input for the heat pump side will be into the sizing of, to, to make sure that the heat use um, and your capital investment makes sense, but it's not directly related to them. Um, Sorry, is that okay? Um, last last yeah, one, sure. I promise. Cormac's back again. Uh, biogas production in wastewater treatment plants. Yeah, wastewater treatment plant. Um, again, Cormac, don't don't don't. I'd be more positive towards towards that one as I understand the, the scheme. Um, in the sense that um, wastewater treatment plants are generally, if I, I think. Um, regarded as a renewable source of, of, of gas, but not, you know, so yeah, anaerobic treatment of, of wastewater treatment, I think, would, would be it. Good. Thanks, folks. So, just in, in wrapping up, um, before uh, thanking uh, Ray for an excellent presentation. Uh, thanks everybody for, for joining us here um, in Clyde Road and online. Um, just to bring your attention, we our next lecture will be on Wednesday the 2nd of May and we'll be discussing the integrated um, single electricity market, so the ISEM developments in that and what's coming down the line. And in addition to that, we'll have another breakfast briefing on likely to be May the 9th uh, in relation to the new NZ standards and Partel guidelines. So it should be very interesting in that. Thanks again for everybody. Really excellent presentation, Ray. And uh, I might just close by asking you to give your appreciation to Ray for excellent presentation. <laughs>